Waltrip, the new kid in town. The future looks bright for this youngster. Waltrip from Franklin, Tennessee takes the lead. No, and of course it's a very tight little racetrack. There's not a lot of room for anything to go wrong. Daryl Waltrip. Daryl Waltrip. Daryl Waltrip. Daryl Waltrip. Daryl Waltrip wins. What a streak that team is on. Oh, one today, Daytona 500. One today, Daytona 500. When I decided that I was going to retire in 2000, it was bittersweet. I didn't end up my career the way I wanted to. And Walter brings the car in, you can hear the engine misfiring, and there's a lot of smoke. It's more than a plug wire, I'm afraid. Daryl Walter gets hard into the wall. Walter have sweated it out just to get into this race. New fans that have started to fall in the sport in the 90s never got to see me when I was at my best. Matter of fact, they never even got to see me when I was just mediocre. They didn't know who Daryl Waltrip was. There were people that didn't know Daryl Waltrip won seven races in a row at Bristol or five Coke 600s or any of those things. 75 was a darn good year for us. We were really, really competitive in, our, in my own car. It was number 17, orange and white, terminal transport. And uh, we came here to Nashville and it was a Mother's Day weekend. My grandmother, my grandfather, all my family came down here for the big races. A couple laps, we took the lead, and that was my first cup win. And it was so cool. The picture that I have, it's my whole family, my mom, my dad, and Michael standing down in the front corner of the car, my grandmother, my grandfather. And, and, and the interesting thing about my grandmother being there was she really was the reason why that I ever even thought about racing. There were five of us kids, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. My grandfather was a deputy sheriff in Owensboro, and he worked traffic on the weekends for the races. My grandmother would bring me to the races with her to keep her company. She didn't like sitting in the grandstand by herself. I'm a little guy, six, seven years old. Those cars fascinated me. Take that thing down there, throw it sideways. Wah, wah, wah. I told my grandmother, you know, Granny, one day, I think I, that's what I want to do. One day I'm going to be a, a race car driver. Mom worked at the IGA, and uh, my dad drove a Pepsi Cola truck. He was a route salesman for Pepsi Cola, so I'd help my dad in the summertime when school was out. There was a hardware store in Owensboro where I grew up. They sold go karts. Every time for the next few weeks, we'd stop by there to deliver Pepsi Colas, and uh, there sat that go kart. They had it on the showroom floor. I'd go over and I'd sit on that thing, and I just, I had this vision. I had this vision of me winning the world's biggest go kart race. Nobody in my family had ever raced before. It wasn't like I'd inherited something. The guy that owned the hardware store, he said, Leroy, that's my dad's name, he said, you got to get that boy a go-kart. I'll sell it to you on credit. Ah, when it came to the Walter family, that was us. We didn't care how much it cost, we just wanted to know how much a month is it. I had a big race at the fairgrounds in Louisville, and we took that go-kart to that race you would have thought I'd ridden a go-kart my whole life. I hopped on that thing, and if, if everybody else was going around that track in 15 seconds, I was going around that track in 13 seconds. But my poor brothers and sisters sacrificed a lot so I could race my go-kart, so I could work on my racing career. Uh, and, and I. I know all of them at the time maybe thought it was a little bit over the top for us to be doing what we were doing. And so when I look at that picture of my first win right down here in Victory Circle and who's standing in there as proud as she could possibly be was my grandmother. Because it wasn't too long after that, that she passed away, but I was always so grateful that she got to see me win my first race. 
Darrell Waltrip, the new young tiger of NASCAR racing. Darrell Waltrip certainly is the man to watch this year. Receives the checkered flag and first place, Waltrip. Darrell Waltrip touches his second straight national driving title. Darrell Waltrip has just walked all over this field tonight. I didn't have to work at driving. It was a natural thing for me to do. I had a talent, and I didn't even know I had it. I was racing in Owensboro and uh, winning every week. Little racetracks teach you car control, throttle control, finesse. You're not going 200 miles an hour, so you got time to absorb more, learn more. It got to be too easy. There was not any competition there for me anymore. So I needed a challenge, and my next challenge I felt like was here at the fairgrounds in Nashville. This racetrack had an incredible reputation. They come from the city, the farm, and the mountains for the one day of the year when the NASCAR driving stars come to Nashville. This is live action on this July 25th, 1970. If you could win a race at Nashville, you got national recognition. Ended up leaving Owensboro, moving down to Franklin, Tennessee to go to work for a man named P.B. Crowell, and he had won the track championship here, and he had the best cars, and he knew this racetrack, and he hired me to drive for him. My dad always told me, and, and it's, it's, it's always the deal, always play with somebody better than you are, because you can learn something from them, and that's where Darrell was when he come in. Darrell couldn't have picked a racetrack any better than the fairgrounds there in Nashville. It was slick, hard to manage, and just having the fastest car was not going to win your race. The old racetrack that I started on uh, was a lot like Darlington. It was narrow. It was kind of a one-groove racetrack. You'd go in and go right up to the top of the banking. Had real high bank, right dead in the middle of the corner. So you went in, you had to run at the wall and turn and come off the wall because you couldn't just go around and make a circle. Some of the worst wrecks probably ever been caused here at the fairgrounds, I caused them. But I learned, and I learned fast. Mr. Donahoe, the promoter here, he wanted to change the track because he couldn't pass, it was hard to race on. So he wanted to change it around, make it a little more uh, exciting. So he decided he was gonna have the highest bank short track in America. He banked this thing up to 36 degrees. And there you see the roller coaster at the state fairgrounds here. This racetrack is something like a roller coaster in its own right with these 35 degree bank turns. When the track was banked as sharply as it was, you look through that windshield in the corner, you can't see very far ahead of you. So you've got to sharpen your reflexes. That's what Nashville really teaches a race driver how to do. Some of the top notch drivers refused to either race there or never really adapted to the racetrack like Darrell did. Once they built that track with the big banks, I mean, he just is like an old comfortable pair of shoes. He just, I mean, he just put a hurting on everybody week after week. I'd watched enough races that I, I, I knew exactly what to do. I mean, it just came to me. so fast and so high banked that we couldn't have a weekly show here. And that's what this joint really was known for back in the day, was weekly racing. So I think the banks now are 18, 20 degrees, something like that. And that's the track you see here now. I firmly believe that Darrell's early experiences here at Nashville is, as much as anything, one of, if not the compelling reason why he was so successful on the NASCAR Cup circuit experiencing those different configurations. Like I said, that first one, like Darlington. Went to Darlington, I was like, Darlington didn't scare me one bit. Darrell Wilford, one of the youngsters, one of the bright newcomers to automobile racing. He has to be patient. He has to discipline himself. And that is one of the tough things to do. They're in traffic again. Walter going down low. He's got him. That took 
took some real nerve to do that. And Waltrip, the big man at Nashville Speedways every Saturday night, is out in front. And then I went to Bristol, and I said, man, this racetrack here at Bristol is just like running a home in Nashville. I'd sit there at a place like Bristol and watch the stopwatches in total amazement how he could click off a lap after lap after lap and only vary a couple of tenths each lap. Far and away, his number one all-time greatest accomplishment was winning seven in a row at Bristol. Darrell Walker will win his fifth in a row. Six races in a row. Seventh time in a row. We'd scream volumes on the talent level of Darrell. Could he have done it without his background here in Nashville? I'm going to say probably not. All the guys that came up in the Carolinas, you know, they had Hickory and they had Martinsville and they had Asheville and all those places. But there was nothing banked like Nashville. This is a great training ground and I learned so much here. The legend of this place and being a part of that legend, it's really important to me. It's been important to my career and uh, it's been important to the success I've had. It was and still is the type track that just produces fabulous racing and produces fabulous race car drivers. Often humorous, sometimes a bit outspoken, but rarely silent, and his articulate wit and quick sense of humor prompted his fellow competitors to nickname him Jaws. I owned this joint. I owned this fairgrounds racetrack. I owned every racetrack I went to until I went to Cup. And then, then I was just a small fish in a big pond. And the best thing I had going for me was my ability to talk and antagonize. The drivers, they were very intimidated by television. They didn't like to face the camera. Leroy, what happened out there? Okay, uh, we, I was following Benny and Dave was, David Pearson was behind me and... Man, I came along. I, I mean, I let to join up. You got any comment? Did you, you, you got anything to say? You don't have to get you bossy. Yankees are all alike. You don't have to get bossy. Never know what to say. Back to the town. <laughs> <laughs> Darrell, he just gets it. He understands the game. A driver has to be good and lucky to win at Talladega. Darrell Walshit, do you feel lucky today? No, but I feel good. <laughs> when they needed stories, they always came to Darrell. And the reason was he... He always had something to say to them that was unique. My mother was probably changing my diapers about the first time this race was run. I don't see relief drivers very much anymore. Well, it's hard on our pride. Where can you rest on this racetrack? <laughs> In the pits. And if you got a good pit crew, it doesn't last very long. <laughs> Daryl was so good at, at, at psyching people out. You know, when it's your turn to win or your track, I guess you're just going to win no matter what. A lot of times we're not the fastest, but when the green flag comes out, we go to the front. Joe. How does it feel to be the biggest cheater here today? <laughs> I always admired his confidence, and I think that that carried him a long way in the sport, and, and the fact that he didn't mind speaking about it, I thought that was good, too. Well, here's Darrell Waldrop in the pits. Then Jared making his way over the wall, going to try to find out what happened. Hey, almost lost the damn thing! Racing here taught me about racing uh, and how to race on difficult racetracks, but those guys taught me all about how to do TV and how to deal with the media and, and how to do interviews and that turned out to be invaluable to me. He was what I would call the first showman of the sport and as a track owner you're thankful for that because he puts the sport on the front page and as a result he sold tickets. I always felt I needed to take the road less traveled uh, because it's not so crowded. When I came in the sport, big belt buckles, cowboy boots, cowboy hats, not me. So I always tried to be different. He embraced the media. He didn't run from it. Uh, I think he understood that this was a platform for him to be able to separate himself from basically the standard NASCAR driver. Because of that, I had a bad reputation. Race fans at that time didn't like somebody different. All of a sudden, this smooth-talking, slick-dressed guy from Tennessee shows up and uh, starts beating their heroes. You know, every week you, you, you wanted to have a rivalry. It sold tickets. It got headlines. It made news. When he come in, he looked at it completely different, I think, than 
the good old boy deal, even though he's from Kentucky, Tennessee, whatever. He tried to put his mark on it, and he did. Darrell Waltrip in the Mercury, number 95, has taken over the lead. He's a hard charger and considered to be one of the most promising rookies on the NASCAR scene. I had to beat Richard Petty. If I was sitting here and you were sitting beside me, say, see that 43 car? He's the king of this sport. He's mine. Coming to turn three, two more turns to go. Richard Petty, Darrell Waltrip. Oh! Petty has got the lead, but there comes Walker. They're coming to the finish line. And it really was showing Petty and was showing the world that this new superstar was here to stay. Now here is Cale Yarborough trying to move back into second place, racing with Darrell Waltrip. You see that 11 car? That's Cale Yarborough, three-time consecutive champion. He's on my list. He's going down. I think it was in Darlington. He crashed me one day in the uh, the race. Oh, oh big action, big action. Both leaders are out of it. Cale Yarborough is still spinning down the track. So the mean old lady at Darlington jumps up and snaps both leaders, Daryl Waltrip and Cale Yarborough. One of us would have won that race if we hadn't wrecked. And when they interviewed Cale, they said, what happened? Some of the news reporter asked me uh, what happened. I just said, Jaws got me. It's always running that mouth and tearing up cars. Looked like Jaws to me. You know, everybody laughed, thought it was funny, and nobody thought about it sticking. I just couldn't resist it. I, I called this friend of mine up down in, uh, down at the beach who was a shark fisherman, and I said, uh, go catch me as big a shark you can and bring it up to, to, to Charlotte. Humpy Wheeler, great promoter that he is, thinking maybe a little different than everybody else, he decides he's going to elevate the legend of Jaws. They bring that shark back up to Charlotte, take the shark, Hook it on the back of a wrecker. That was pretty wild. I mean, had this shark hanging upside down. I'm not sure that Daryl was very receptive to that, but uh, Humpy Wheeler didn't care. And of course, Gail was raising more Holly Farms chicken at the time. The coup was I had a dead chicken that had not been plucked, uh, and I stuck the chicken down in, in, in that shark's mouth. The legend of Jaws. She was alive and well after that. Walter, the new kid in town. With his first Grand National win coming only two weeks ago, the future looks bright for this 28-year-old youngster. You know, back in the day, pretty much if you wanted to get into cup racing or really any kind of race, you had to do it on your own. You had to do it out of your own pocket. We start the 75 season and we got nice cars. I was spending money I didn't have, but people trusted me. First of all, they saw my passion. They saw my vision and, and I could back it up. Here comes Kyle Walker. It's going to be a wild finish. Bobby Allison knows how to use a lot of race back here and takes the checker. I tell you, Daryl's not to be denied. He really drove a good hard race. Diegard was around at the time. Donnie Allison was driving for him. My brother-in-law, the die of Diegard, Mike the Prosper was his name. He was from Connecticut and hadn't made a lot of money before he was 30, and I had made a lot of money before I was 30. And he approached me in, in this game of Pinochle about the fact that he had bought a car Bobby Allison was having a build to run it at Daytona. And he said, would you like to go half with me? And I said, I don't know anything about racing. You know, I'm not, that's not my world. And he said, ah, come on, it'll be fun. Donnie Allison was driving the car. And the 4th of July race of 1975 didn't go so well. We go to Daytona, it's 4th of July race. And the uh, car's running good. I passed Donnie on the last lap of the race. Darrell Waltrip, the youngster who won earlier this year at Nashville, Tennessee. He takes the number four spot, and Donnie Allison will finish in the number five position. And of course, I'm from a world of not losing. I'm used to making business deals and winning. Bill Gardner, high strung, big businessman, and he's not used to losing and getting beat every week by that 17 car and that kid from Tennessee that doesn't have two nickels to rub together, and he keeps beating us every week. I'd made a decision that if I didn't feel we were that competitive and going to win, that we needed to make a change. And so after that 1975 Fourth of July race, I terminated our relationship with Donnie Allison. Bill French said, uh, have you seen Bill Gardner? They want to hire you to drive their car. I said, well, that's ridiculous. I got my own team. I got my own cars. I'm better than they are. 
So I get back in the car, and Steve and I are driving up the road, and I said, honey, you're not going to believe what just happened. That die guard bunch wants to hire me to drive their car. Of course, Stevie knows the financial shape we were in, how much money we were spending, how much money we owed. We really didn't have anything going for us <laughs> other than just his desire. So uh, in the middle of 75, we parked all my stuff. I called Jake and all the guys together, and told them what I was going to do. And I said, but here's the deal. I'm going to make them hire all of y'all. And that's when things really improved. as the checkered flag falls for car number 88. Coming to the finish line, it is Darrell Waltrip winning the Rebel 500. Seeing the hometown guy do that good that early, then you had to think there were better things down the road. Darrell was driving the wheels off the car. 126 races was a testament to his, uh, his capabilities and what he wanted to show the world. It was kind of like a coming out party. We won several races in 77, 78, same thing, and then 79, we made a strong run at the championship. Darrell Waltrip certainly is the man to watch this year. Waltrip wins it by just about a half a car length. I didn't get beat by the competition, I beat myself. Look, we've got a situation in Darrell Waltrip, he's all over the racetrack. Darrell Waltrip, who had built up almost a mile and a half lead on his nearest competitor. I've always regretted losing that championship and so that was one of those life lessons I learned and I, I take it with me everywhere I go to this day don't beat yourself we lost by 11 points to Richard Petty and it's almost like in any sport you know teams that have won championships consistently like a Richard Petty or the Wood Brothers or a Junior Johnson they can let it all hang out more I think we took more of a conservative approach Dale had won three consecutive championships. He comes to me in 1980 and he says, I'm gonna give you some of the best advice anybody ever gave you. Junior doesn't even know it yet, but I wanna run a partial schedule. I'm tired of racing every week. And I know that Junior would really like to have you in his car. Daryl uh, was a good guy. He liked to talk, but he was good. He was a good guy. And he, was a, he was a heck of a race car driver. And uh, I felt like if, if I was gonna leave one of the best positions in the, in the country in racing that uh, I should let somebody know about it. So naturally, Junior would look around just like I would if I had been in his position at that time and say, well, who is the best driver now in the sport? And it obviously was Darrell Walter. When I lost Kale, you know, I knew that he was the next up cover. When we got word that uh, Junior might be interested in having Darrell be his driver, that was huge to us. I mean, the man's a legend, and he had the best car in the sport at the time, and won championships and races, and he'd won 50 races himself. I was flabbergasted, but I had a problem. I had this darn contract. I intend to enforce the contract to the letter of the law, and I hope that uh, Darrell will be driving for us in 1981 and 82. No one had did contracts at that time. They, they weren't from the, my, the business world that I was from. So much language in there that that, that there was no way that we were just going to be able to say, I'm walking. I knew that major sponsorships required um, moral turpitude clauses and things that most of these drivers had never even heard of. There were no written contracts. So all this was new. My position was if he wanted to get out of the contract, that we needed to have compensation. So we ended up negotiating a deal, and Junior ended up putting up 100 grand. Mountain Dew put up 100 grand, and I borrowed 100 grand from my father-in-law. It was an investment in my future. Probably could have stayed at Diegard and toughed it out, but I wanted to drive for the legend. I wanted to drive for a man that I, I knew would, would take me from just being a, a race car driver to a champion. And because I saw, I, I'd seen what he did with Kale, and I wanted that too. with Junior Johnson. It's like a rebirth for me, and I'm just looking forward to 1981. I think it's going to be the best year I ever had. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. This could be my defining moment in the sport, and I knew that. Just one little small hiccup. The team did not want me to be their driver. 
honestly, it was more like, oh dear God, please not Daryl Walter, because Daryl was one of our biggest rivals. Well, Daryl wasn't no question he was gonna be a great race driver, but everybody that I had on the team didn't like Daryl cause sometimes he'd beat us. It's a big learning process between when you're trying to get acclimated to a new guy, and now we're going into a model change year. All those cars came from 116 inches to 110 inches. The tread widths came from 66 and a half inches down to 62 inches. And we were trying to refine and define that. Those cars were evil, hard to drive. A lot like what we went through, you know, in the last few years with the COT car. Well, that was a big change in the 80s, just like that was a big change in 2000. Uh -oh. And Waltrip spins as he comes off the turn board. Junior finally came to us, and he had a little meeting of the minds. He was about ready to have all he could stand with the crew, all he could stand with Daryl complaining about the crew. Brewer and I are about ready to kill each other. Finally, Junior grabs us both by the collar and says, y'all come with me. And boy, when Junior gets mad, you got trouble. He pulled us up in the front of that old hauler, and he said, let me tell you two knuckleheads something. I'm sick and tired of your belly aching. Either you get out there, you get your heads together, you work on that car, and you get along, or guess what? You and you are both going to be looking for a job. We got along fine after, you know, a race or two. Darrell knew what he had to do, and he knew he had the best car on the racetrack, and he took it and proved it. Darrell Waltrip receives the checkered flag and first place. It's been the lucky weeks. Last week, winning at Richmond and right here at Rockingham, Darrell Waltrip wins again, makes it two in a row. Car number 11, driven by Darrell Waltrip, has dominated NASCAR Grand National Racing, winning almost every race it enters. By the end of the season, we went to North Wilkesboro, Martinsville, Charlotte, and Rockingham in the fall. We set on four poles and won four races in a row. We came off with a, a brashness that I think really helped us take it to our competition and eventually you know, helped lead us to a championship in 81. We ended up winning 12 races. The championship, nobody could touch us. But it looked like kind of a, an easier day for you. That's the problem with me, I make it look too easy. <laughs> it was a perfect year. First team to be honored in New York at the Waldorf. We're just happy as we can possibly be. Me and Brewer and Harold and all of us were celebrating. And uh, Brewer said, uh, had a good year. Been good. But we're leaving. What? Yep. We're going to go to work for MC Anderson. Well, I was crushed. We just bonded. We just kind of all got together, and they were going to leave. Their fortune became my fortune, because when everybody had left and the smoke had cleared, you know, I saw an opportunity. So I walked in the office, and I told Junior, I really would like to have a shot at being your crew chief. And uh, he looked at me, and he said, OK. And everybody said, oh, it's a sinking ship. They'll never win another championship. Look at the people they got. Darrell and I's relationship had been real rocky up to that point. But fortunately for me, I think he saw the sincerity and my commitment to him. 82 was a great year. 12 more wins, another championship. I just need to thank Junior and Jeff Hammond and all the boys that work so hard on this race car. I tell you right now, we got a super crew for 82. You know, 81 and 82, you couldn't have scripted better years uh, for so many reasons. That $300,000 investment I made paid off. He proved our side of it, and he decided he was the best driver at that given time, and he might very well could have been the best driver to ever drove a race car. Darrell Waltrip, a hand in the air, a wave to the crowd of 100,000 plus. He wins $200,000. He blows up. What a Hollywood ending. The motor blew right when it took the checker. It blew all the pieces. The guy just flipped, had the talent. He could wrestle it out of a car. It's all over for the 1985 Winston Cup season. Darrell Waltrip wins the championship. 85, we win the championship, but it wasn't pretty. Junior decided that 
maybe I don't have the same desire I had, that the fire had gone out. Junior was just Junior. He, uh, he uh, wanted uh, everything his way. And I don't knock him for that. I mean, that's, that's business. But uh, I think that uh, brought the downfall because Darrell's competitiveness uh, never faltered. During the 86 season, by now, Rick Henry, mm, this guy, this car dealer, all of a sudden, he's getting his legs under him. And because he was a Chevrolet dealer, things started flowing over toward the Hendrick side and less toward the Junior side. But you'd tell Junior Johnson that, and he'd want to hit you with one of them left hooks. And so we were kind of coming apart at the seams. Things like that happen. You don't get mad. You just move on and do the best you can. So I call Rick up, and I say, Rick, let's do it. End up making the deal to drive the Tide car in 1987, because it had the makings of something really, really great. About the only thing Darrell Waltrip has not won in his stellar Winston Cup career is the Daytona 500. But when he became the third driver in the Rick Hendrick stable, the odds became better than ever that he would break a long-standing drought. You know, he'd won championships, he'd won a lot of races. Uh, but to really cap his career off, Darrell really wanted to win the Daytona 500. In 89, uh, we had this new engine package. We go to Daytona and this thing was bad to the bone. I mean, it was it ran like it didn't even have a restrictor plate on it. Hammond and I all were so excited, we're nervous. Are we cheating on something? Is the engine illegal? What's going on? And a guy named Art Krebs checks the carburetor on all the engines. He takes my carburetor off, and he immediately says, you can't run that. So what do you mean we can't run that? That's not legal. So they took my carburetor. Well, that carburetor was worth about 15 horsepower. The carburetor we put on the engine, not so much power, but really good gas mileage. And we are set to go racing 200 laps in the Daytona 500. Door to door, nobody pulling out to pass. They just stay in line side by side as they head for turn one. Boy, Waltrip is in trouble. He's just falling way back. The car was going slower and slower. Darrell was starting to you know, get agitated and frustrated because he could feel this wind you know, getting away from him. Okay, Darrell, let's go back through. When you get in position, tell me what you want to try and do to the car right quick. I think we ought to take two out of the right rear and put two in the left rear if you don't want to move in the front. Okay, I understand that, but if you think you need it in the front, now's the time to do it. As the day went on, we kept coming in. We'd come in just on the car, come in just on the car. 500 miles a long time at Daytona. My job as a crew chief was to get him as happy as you possibly could at the end of the day. And we start thinking about this thing and all of a sudden realize, you know, we pack that thing full of fuel on that last stop. We might be able to go to distance. When they gave one to go with 55 laps to go, we came down pit road. We topped up with fuel. Everybody else stayed out. Are they going to be able to go that 55 laps on the tank of fuel? Stevie had sat there and she had worked with the guys on the fuel mileage and she did all the calculating and she told Hammond we could make it. And I said, you guys, we know how to lose this race. Let's win it. Let's take a chance here. What have we got to lose? What has yeah, he got to lose? To go. That's right. The only thing they remember is first place. We're talking about three laps further than we've been all day. And he says, we're going to go for it. Draft, draft. Sure enough, everybody starts stopping for fuel. And the first thing you know, it's just me and Alan Kowicki. It's obvious he's going to try to make it too. And I, I'm good but I don't have the car to pass him with. Well, here come those two cars, Kowicki and Waltrip. They are not making any effort to slow whatsoever. They're going to stay on the racetrack. Lo and behold, he takes off up the hill. Now Kowicki is out of the throttle. He drifts high in the banking. Darrell Waltrip takes the lead. Waltrip in front. I think he's going to take the gamble. He is drafting all around the track off anyone he can find, trying to conserve fuel. Then we had the fuel pressure gauge, and that thing is jumping all over the place, and it's... You know, it's four, seven pounds, it's no pounds, it's all over the place, and the motor's <laughs> I'm screaming on the radio, I'm not gonna make it! I'm not gonna make it, I'm out of fuel! I'm out of fuel! You know, I was a cheerleader, and if you give him that little bit of encouragement, you know, when he started faltering a little bit, he'd bring it right back on line. I know it's tough, I know it's tough, but you got to hang on. One lap to go, will that fuel last? One more lap, one more lap, 
go in the first turn. Here we go again. Ball trip under power still in turn number three. I think he's going to make it. Coming in the third turn, I'm crying. I'm not crying like a rat eating an onion. She's kind of chugging along. And sure enough, coasted across the start finish line. Won that stupid race. And I've been trying to win for 17 straight years. The Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waltrip. Daryl, how long? Wait, 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 wait. This is the, this is the Daytona 500, isn't it? <laughs> you bet Don't it tell is. me it isn't. Thank God. It just shows that as much as a perfectionist has always tried to be, that whole week was anything from perfect, but it ended up with the perfect result. Boy, what an incredible list of people. Boy, I've done a pretty amazing job of hiring some, some very talented people. As good as 89 was. Uh, I mean, that was a great year. I won most popular driver. I won Daytona. I won seven races. I won all my favorite races, Martinsville, Bristol, Atlanta, Charlotte, Daytona. And Ham and I sat down one morning and I said, look, we can spend a sponsor's money just as good as these guys can. I think we could have won a championship with Darrell if he'd stayed, but he had this desire to do his own team. You know, when a guy gets that in his head, then you've got to let him go do it. I remember I never felt felt so helpless that when he finally separated from Rick Hendrick and I looked in that race shop and I saw my toolbox, that was it. And we were going to build a race team around that. First year, me and Hammond, and we had a great group of guys. We were doing our own cars and getting the motors from Hendrick Motorsports. Everything started off beautifully. And Daryl Waltrip will win his first race in September of 1989. At the end of 91, I said, I can't believe I waited this long to do this. Got our legs under us in 92. We come out strong. Here's Waltrip off of corner number four, and the checkered flag waves. Throw my heart out for you. Yes. I'm close for you. <laughs> at the end of 92, I looked at what we were doing, and I said, for us to get to where I want to go, first of all, we got to do our own engine program. We had the, uh, uh, the equipment and the availability to build engines in-house, and it's just something that Darrell wanted to try. That was the beginning of the end. That was my demise. Daryl Waltrip in the pit area. Got the hood up on yeah. his car. Problems with Daryl's power plant. Going under the hood. Look at the smoke coming oh, now out you now. See it. Yeah, you guys got it. He blew it up. It broke me. It was cost me $600,000 a month to keep this place open. Well, the first month, that's $600,000. I'm OK. I'm OK. Next month, that's another. Oh, that's a million, too. I, I'm OK. The next month, another $600,000, that's a million eight. Whoop, time out. I don't know that he ever doubted his ability as a driver, but as a car owner, yes. I need to prove to some of you guys in here, a lot of you guys, probably all of you guys, as a matter of fact, that I can still get the job done. I'd just like to get myself in a position where I can be a race car driver. If Daryl's not believed in, he doesn't perform well. and. Um, that kind of was going on. My performance is down. People were making fun of me for taking champions provisionals. I didn't have the money. You know, I was in pretty bad shape. Whatever the team needed, he wanted to give it to them. And he wants to, to be competitive. And uh, so to sell his team like he had to was devastating for him. It was the hardest thing he ever had to do. I needed to get out from under the headaches of owning a race team finalized that deal uh, this past week uh, with this gentleman sitting to my uh, left here, Tim Beverly. He's uh, a businessman. He thinks he can run the team better than I can, and I agree with it. 
In the meantime, Earnhardt has started DEI. And he's got Pennzoil as a sponsor, and he was in a panic because Pennzoil was putting pressure on him. They weren't getting the results. Strong, oh, Steve, Steve Park. Steve Park got hurt in Atlanta, broke his leg, and couldn't drive. You know, with Steve laid up and uh, we're working on getting Steve well again, it gave us an opportunity to put a, a truly great driver in there and, and bring a lot of confidence to the team. First of all, I was very honored and, and uh, pleased that Dale would call me and ask me to do that. At a time when he needed help and I needed help, and it, re it, it did so much for me. Darrell Walter running in seventh position, and he's feeling racy. Well, here goes Look at Darryl. Darryl Walter. <laughs> this has kind of been a new leash on life for him. It really pepped him up, and, and he got back to the, the old Darrell that we had known before. All he's got to do is focus on driving. And look how well Darryl Walter is running. Look at him go. Darryl, a lot of people left you for dead. You've shown them that you still have the fire. They didn't put quite enough dirt on me. Kicked it off and crawled back out. I've been in holes before and uh, crawled, crawling out of a pretty deep one right now, but damn, this is good. If I could have stayed in that one car the rest of the year, I'm pretty sure I'd have won a couple of races for Dale. But that last couple of years I drove, I drove for Travis Carter and the Kmart team. You know, another couple of years of floundering around, not being very competitive. So I decided it was time for me to quit, and it was so sad. Hard to believe, man, that, uh, that I ain't going to do this no more. This is hard to believe. I have loved this, and I've done so much. Fought it so hard and so long. Hard to walk away from. It was bittersweet, disappointing, but it was the right time to quit and the right opportunity came along for me to get out of the car and then transitioning into the TV booth where I'm just, was a natural. I know all too well it's a 400 lap race, but folks, what I'm worried about are those first 10. This racetrack's been laying here in the sun all afternoon, beating down on it, that turn up there, turn three and four, it's like hitting glass. I got to tell you, Larry, I think you'd agree. If that 48 car is that good this early, look out, because we know what he can do when the sun goes down. Darryl is special. And somebody says, well, don't you get tired of playing second fiddle to Walter? No. That's been my role since, since 81. I love being his wingman, his co-pilot. The accolades I've got for my work in television and the success I've had there far off six any of those bad last two or three years I had in driving. So uh, I'm proud of what I've done. I'm proud of my I'm proud of my accomplishments and I love my job. Can't imagine it could have worked out any other way. You know we're sitting right here at the Nashville Fairground Speedway where it all started and my first win in 1975. It started on a journey that uh, I knew I wanted to go, and I knew I, what I wanted to happen, but I, I didn't know if it ever would or not. And, and so uh, the sport has been good to me. It's been my platform uh, my whole life. It's what I stand on. It's who I am. I've helped grow the sport at times when, when the you know, like in the 80s when it needed a spokesperson, I was there. I hope people look at me and say that uh, me being in this sport has made the sport better because me being in this sport has made me better. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. And one of the things I always dreamed of was being called a Hall of Famer, and now I am.